Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Arlene Cohen. You're listening to the midweek version of Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for the needle artists. Oh, we are artists this week. Oh, That's yes, we are. We're artists. Yes. Okay, we got some things I got to get on the board here. Okay. Um, Anne Marie Carr, and I didn't send you these things, so ride with me. I'm uh, going with <laughs> Anne Marie Carr uh, is part of Stitch In to Summer Needlepoint Retreat, June 7 to 9. Brass Brass Lantern Inn in Stowe, Vermont. I'll go just to go to Vermont. I think anything, a place called the Brass Lantern Inn, is that what you just said? Yep. Sounds like an awesome place to go. So, yeah, keep mm-hmm. keep talking here. Okay. So, uh, uh, there are many places, there are, I don't know how many places, what do I know about this? Um, there are places available uh, for this retreat, the Stitch Into Summer Needlepoint Retreat. Uh, just uh, have to contact Anne. And see, Ann uh, teaches at the BF Good Stitch store, and a professional would have looked at up where that's at, but you know how that goes. And uh, she also is featured in the book, the Needlepoint book, third edition by Joe Ippolito Christensen. So um, Ann is going to teach there, and uh, looked for her website, didn't find anything, but uh, contact Ann if you're interested. It's A N N E C A R R Salem, A N N E C A R R S A L E M at yahoo.com. And Anne will give you all of the information that you need for this. So if you want to go to Vermont the first part of June, hmm. and why wouldn't you? Yeah, well, sit and stitch and be in Vermont. Right. I don't, sounds like a great combination to me. Stitch into summer, needlepoint retreat. So that sounds like fun. Mm-hmm. I have to be elsewhere, but. Sounds like fun. And then uh, for those who listened Sunday, and if you haven't listened to Sunday's show with uh, Brendan and Karen Kirk, you need to do that because that was a fun conversation with them. Uh, Brendan was kind enough to send a free chart to us. And, oh, no. Well, anyway. Uh, he sent a free chart, which is a motif from a sampler, and the sheet that has the name of the sampler on it, I did not bring with me. So that's excellent. <laughs> I am flying. I'm flying today. I'm really cooking. Yes. Yes. Outstanding. So anyway, a free chart, um, 50 by, it looks like, 70 stitches. Beautiful little uh, flower pot thing that uh, Brandon, put, Brendan, Brandon, Brendan put together uh, with the DMC colors that you can have for free. So on the uh, We Talk Fiber page for this podcast will be a download for that chart. Free stuff. Yay. Yeah. So, uh, and it, just a cute little thing. You know, do, up a, do it up for a card or something and make even a little pillow out of it, whatever. But, uh, and, and an excellent example of what one of the benefits I think that's underrated with samplers is pulling out the motifs and just making single unit things out of them. Mm-hmm. So thanks to Brendan for that. And listen to last Sunday's show to hear about what Brendan and Karen are doing. Cause it's pretty exciting. Mm-hmm. And then do not forget the uh, 10% off at the Royal school of needlework of their online courses. I'll have a link uh, on the We Talk Fiber page for this podcast, as I did last week and the week before. Ten uh, percent off. Use the uh, code Talk Ten at R- it's rsnonlinecourses.com. I believe that is, but check the link. Um, and I pared down the papers that I needed for this, and obviously <laughs> I overpaired. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, do that because if uh, online courses in, in several techniques. off from the Royal School of Needlework. But now remember that this uh, offer is only through the end of the month. So act now if you want to uh, take a course, 10% off and save some money uh, Mm -hmm. from the Royal School there. Um, uh, Links and everything on the page. But uh, yeah, get on that because there's some, there's, well, there's gold work, Jacobean or Jacobean cruel work. Uh, What's that? Or Jacobian, if you just want to add another option in. Is that how we do it? 
I'm not sure what the real way is. I'm not sure either. Just keep going. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's a canvas work, gold work, that one, that, that J Jacob, that Jacob cruel. <laughs> and, uh, I forget. Oh, I think there's a black work. Anyway, there's several to choose from. So an excellent way to, uh, dive in and try a new technique or just simply take a course from the Royal school, which, Hey, what's wrong with that? Uh, so, and then that was two weeks ago. We talked to the ladies from the Royal school. That was fun too. So, uh, act quick though, uh, talk 10 is the code save 10% on an online course with the Royal school. Okay. That's all the things for which I'm only half prepared. <laughs> Outstanding effort on my part. I think. Excellent. Excellent effort. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of talent, a lot of talent. Okay. You just came back. Now we, we both were at events last week. Mm -hmm. So you just came back from the stitch nanigans retreat in yes. Phoenix, outside in, of Phoenix, outside of Phoenix in Chandler, Arizona. Uh, this was a retreat put on by McKenna, known as uh, uh, Stitching in Sequins, both on FlossTube and on Instagram. Very dear friend of mine. Um, and, and the play on the word of shenanigans and stitch nanigans, that's where stitch nanigans came from. Um, and it was just a, a marvelous, wonderful time. Um, I think I, I've mentioned this before. I know if you go back a few years ago, uh, certainly before I started experiencing floss too, before I learned about this wonderful stitching community that exists online. Um, I, the idea of going away for a few days and just sitting in a room and stitching, like, why would I pay all this money to do that? I, I didn't, I didn't get it. I fully admit I didn't get it. But as I became more involved in the floss tube community, as I started to meet people, as I started to realize how many stitchers are out there who love what I love, it does become this desire to, how can I get together with them and how, how and where and when. And, um, and so there, you know, it's not always the, the easiest to make it a work in, in schedules and life and everything. But um, how could I turn down this opportunity? McKenna coming to New Jersey and helping me with the New Jersey retreat last May. Um, and when she said, I, I got to, I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking yeah, I'm going out there. So um, this was an opportunity for 75, 80 uh, of us got together. Um, she, McKenna, found this wonderful place. I mean, when I say I'm talking the physical location now for the moment, um, the the this is something that just would be impossible to find on the East Coast, or at least this part of the East Coast where I am. Um, this hotel that we were at was it was like a resort hotel, so that all the the ballroom spaces there, including the the space that we were using for our stitching room, are just they open up to the right immediate outside. Like right outside our room was a nice patio area. Um, at various times, there were a few groups of people that were bringing some stitching outside. It was not too hot. It was I mean, and this was McKenna choosing purposely to do this in April so that it would be the right weather. And and then on top of that, we just lucked out and had beautiful days out there. Um, in the area that this was in Chandler, Arizona, every there was this immediate walkable um, area of a number of restaurants and food options. So that is is huge when especially having a large percentage of the people who flew in. I, I know there were people who drove also, but I, I don't know what, exactly what the percentages were. Um, but to sit for a few days and be in the company of people who love what you love um, and admire to admire what everyone is working on uh, the the retreat as with the other couple of retreats that I've been to there are certain things that I have mm, come to expect meaning uh, there's a an opportunity to bring uh, finishes or nearly finishes or whatever you want to put on the table to share a show and to ta show and tell table if or whatever words you want to call it um, and that, you know, just to admire. And some of them are items that you have seen people showing on their floss tube channels. So you can see something and say, oh, that must be so-and-so's because I saw it on their channel. But plenty of others that you don't necessarily know whose it is. And you're then half the fun is tracing out whose it is and then going over and having a conversation with them. 
Um, there's also the opportunity for a freebie table. Hey, well, I'm wait, 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 that's that's interesting right there to be able to you know, you saw what people finished and yep. then to be able to talk to them. Yes. About that piece. That's that interests me. You know, what was did you enjoy it? You know, are, I'd like to do it. Are there areas where I need to really pay attention? Some real pluses there. Absolutely. There was, um, I know one of the pictures I posted, I was just posting some pictures on Instagram and there was someone who, who, who was not in the room who asked for some information about one of the pieces that they um, saw in my picture. And so I didn't know whose it was, and I had to at first trace out. All right, I showed the picture to people who <laughs> this is, and then I found whose it was, and then I had to go over to the person and introduce myself and say, hey, you know, on Instagram, somebody asked about it. And so not only was I helping out some random person out there, I was then given the opportunity to, like, chat with her about it, which is just wonderful, you know? Right, um, right. And then, there, you know, there was – there were um, – a couple of cases of pieces that, you know, more than one person had stitched it. And so you get that wonderful opportunity to compare, oh, you did it that way and she did it that way. And just how cool is that to see those variations? Um, uh, just, um, I had my, I brought my Gossamer lace piece there. So it was very, I'll admit, very gratifying the number of people who appreciated being able to see it in person after I had been showing it on videos for so long. It, it's not yet framed and it's partially, I was waiting to frame it because I could roll it up in a tube and bring it in a suitcase, um, to this event. And so that is, you know, th there's something to be said about seeing it in per seeing seeing any stitching in person um that is just that step above being able to see it on a video screen you know right. oh yeah yeah and you know and that's just wonderful there was a piece that was framed oh my gosh i'm blanking on the name there is a person who does amazing amazing framing within the cross stitch world like um and somebody uh, like you send your stuff to her and with the amazing matting and framing and stuff and somebody had a piece framed by her there and so it was an opportunity to see one of those pieces framed in person and be able to ask that person questions and how did you do it how long did it take and so on how did you pick right. out what you wanted um so yeah it would you know those that that's just wonderful to have okay that. so what what are the components i mean we, we obviously have food and beverage and oh, then yeah. and then yeah. we we have a room now at these retreats is, is it a room where you can leave your stuff at night yeah. and yeah. because the room gets locked up at night okay. and so okay. there is pretty i mean i won't leave my purse there right <laughs> well yeah yeah but certainly all stitching stuff is left there in the room at night it gets locked at night gets opened up with the first stitcher in the morning that's the way um, McKenna had it set up with the hotel in terms of the, the, the security there and how they were going to be able to lock the room and unlock the room. Um, the, uh, so, I mean, to, yes, you, you need a room that is large enough to hold the group that you are having. And in most cases, you're talking about a, a small ballroom size. We're not talking a 300 wedding attendee, you know, wedding guest size ballroom, because like this hotel had a large ballroom for a large wedding size. Um, this was one of their smaller rooms. Um, and there are round tables set up. And there was, a, I mean, I felt pretty comfortable and sort of switching around seats at various times. And it, there was very much uh, if some if there was no one sitting there at a given moment, um, it was okay, you know, within a certain comfort zone to kind of pull up another chair or move things gently aside. Oh, um, that would that would creep me out. No, at, at yours, I'll be in a corner somewhere and I ain't moving. No. Well, there, but you know what? <laughs> let me let me let me step back a second. I I would definitely say there were some tables that very much stayed put, and there were other tables that tended to have more people who moved around a little bit. And I would hope, I, I hope for anyone who's listening, because a number of people did come up to me and say that they listened to Fiber Talk, which was very sweet to have those kinds of conversations as well. So hello to everybody who was at Sitch Nanigans and made that kind of comment to me. Um, I hope that whichever, whatever you felt comfortable with felt okay to you. That for the, for the times when someone said, hey, can I sit down here for a little bit? 
that that felt okay with you. And if you were someone who liked your spot and stayed in your spot, that that felt comfortable to you as well. You know, there, like I said, there are plenty of people that I don't think moved around and that's perfectly fine. Um, and I think, you know, you, you want to hope, you want to hope that at any event like this, everyone is doing what is comfortable for them. As I think we can say within the stitching community, there is probably a higher percentage of introverts than extroverts. Um, I think that's a fair enough statement to say. I think when you are together with other stitchers, it helps the introverts immensely. I, I mean, I, I am a, I, I, I'll put it out there. I am an introvert. There's no doubt about it. But I did feel quite comfortable in this environment. And, I so, and it's one of the things I've come to love and so appreciate that I can, I can be around people who, who get it and it's okay, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have, uh, have the room yes. and then obviously stitching can be done outside, which if you're in Arizona and that time of year, you, yeah, just go outside. But yeah. um, uh, then what we have, uh, uh, when you, you arrive, we have a gift bag and uh, yep, there, what, so yeah. how does that all work? Well, it could work however you want it to work. McKenna chose to do it where she was more or less spreading out the gifts throughout the days. So when you arrive, people got a few things. And um, then that night she gave everyone something. And then the next morning when there was just an opportunity for a couple announcements, she ended it with, now everyone gets something else. And then oh, okay. she, she chose to spread it out like that. Um, the New Jersey retreat that I did last um May I hand everyone got a bag when they arrived and it had a whole bunch of stuff in it all at once. So, you know, you could do it however you wish is what a, the, the answer to the question. Um, so it's, and that's just part of the fun of the, right. the little, right. the little extras that make it um, what you want it with being near a major, well, being near any kind of needlework store, but certainly a large needlework store like the attic, um, there was a lot of coming and going throughout the days. Um, we were all we were all given the hours of the attic, you know, when they were open. Um, there were some people with cars. There was a lot of Ubering, anyone going, want to share a ride kind of thing going on. Um, so during the days, I am in no way going to claim all 75 people were in the room for, you know, 12 hours the whole time. That certainly was not the case. Okay, so that was the other thing I was trying to understand is, is it, it's, so it's a pretty fluid day then, people coming and going, lunch, Absolutely. breakfast, dinner, whatever. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. Um, there uh, certainly, the, yes, there was definitely um, – visits to the needlework store there was definitely again because especially because this a place this was an area that had walkable restaurants and people you know will sort of eat a little bit on their own time especially um depending how late you stayed up at night and how early you got up in the morning <laughs> uh -huh. um, so definitely fluid going in and out at various times of the day um, and there, I suppose there might've been a few people that went in the pool or kind of did a little bit of that. If there was, there wouldn't be that much, but certainly sitting outside at various times, um, walking around, um, the, the areas of the hotel at various times, even if it was like, I needed to go to the lobby to get something, I would pass little groups of stitchers here and there kind of thing. Um, because there was a lot of seating you know, little seating groups. Um, but for the most part, I think we stitchers were, were mostly staying in the seating groups that were near where the room was. Um, and, and at night, I think the, in the evenings, there were probably more people staying in the room area. Um, well, but then a whole bunch of people would do dinner a little bit more on the later side. You mm -hmm. know, again, it was, it, was, it was a very comfortable atmosphere that you could do what was most comfortable for you. And I would say that's that's the truth about all the retreats that I've been at, that there's a, a comfort level of what you want to do um, in terms of being in the room, um, taking advantage of other things in the area. Yeah. By that, I mean food and need a work store. Yeah. It's, you know, it's I, I kind of chuckle because I, I followed it as much as I could on Instagram. Uh -huh. And you know, all these stitchers in the Phoenix area – and it was clearly a cross stitch group because there are four 
four, at least four, certainly four, excellent needlepoint stores in Phoenix, <laughs> and not one mention of any of them. Well, so, yeah, yeah, no, this is this is <laughs> certainly stemmed from the cross stitch world. Yeah, there's yeah. no doubt about that. And that's the ret the retreats that I have referred to that I am talking about is definitely within the cross stitch world. There are gatherings of people that I would say are probably more needle pointers. It, and uh, this is just not the, the, re the retreat. Mm, I, I don't no, want to say you know, it's, 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 it's the orientation. It, I just got to chuckle out of it because it really is. Phoenix is really a Mecca for needle work in general. And, huh. um, uh, but yeah, <laughs> it's just, you know, that's all right. It's, well, but, and I wonder, do those, so you might be more familiar with them. Do those stores have, events do those stores have workshops do those stores oh yeah have... oh yeah yeah classes and... all the time yeah okay so oh, those yeah. so those are just the things that are um maybe not making it to the floss tube in the instagram well, no they're not no they're not yeah. at all and oh no like quail run they have a gorgeous uh classroom gorgeous uh -huh. classroom yeah really beautiful oh no they they're all very active um but you know it's it's just interesting hmm. um yeah. So, you know, that sounds uh, sounds fun. So you were there what, Friday night, Saturday, and then Sunday, and people start filtering out Sunday? Yes, actually. So I went a little bit early, and a lot of people arrived on Thursday. Um, oh, okay. And some of that is just about traveling logistics and, you know, all kinds. So, yeah, no, a lot of and And I think, yeah, it's also like wanting to capitalize on as much time as you can. <laughs> um, right. So, yeah, I, I, a lot, a lot were there on Thursday. Um, with the rest arriving on Friday. Um, and again, logistics of travel, I stayed until Monday and left like 6.30 a.m. Monday. It wasn't, you know, but I was there. What was nice is that McKenna was able to keep the stitching room through Sunday night. So there really wasn't a, a, a time that you, that stitchers had to leave the room. Yeah. But people started filtering out as travel plans, you know, required. Right. Um, so yeah, I think it it was a it all was a great time, and it was, you know, it feeds the soul to be with people like that yeah. they get you, and that you you know you 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 just can't put a price on that in a lot of ways. Yep. Well, yeah. looking forward to experiencing the one in August uh, out there well, in in your end of the world. So yep, yeah. When, when it'll be raging hot, humid as all get out. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was certainly talking about humidity versus dry heat when when you know, it's very not not that we spent a lot of time talking about the weather. I promise you that. OK, yep. but there there were some comments and jokes about, um, God, I hope it isn't going to be awful, awful August humidity when it is. You know, it is, yeah, no. <laughs> you know, no. And, yeah, and, and that'll be the one where I need to make sure and bring a, a heavy shirt or something because the air conditioning will be like a chill box in the hotel and yeah 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 yep. been down that road yep. yep so yeah so now now on the needlepoint end of things last week our fox chapter had a pilot class with curdy mm -hmm. biggs and yes. now curdy biggs for those who don't know is uh, a charted canvas geometric design designer mm -hmm. and uh when it, she's one who teaches regularly at the ANG annual seminar. And one of the things that is required is that you must do a pilot class if, you, if, if you're going to teach a project at the seminar. So uh, she came to the Fox chapter, which was 10 miles down the road at, at the church I attend, and so very easy for me. Um, and so then members from our chapter could sign up to do this class. And I'd never done a pilot class. I've only done a couple of needlepoint classes because I'm pretty much self-taught, mm -hmm. basically all self-taught. Only done a couple of classes. I'd never done a pilot class, and I didn't get it. Mm. And you know, people had explained, and yeah, it sounds good going in, but I didn't really get it. And so this this was an opportunity, and uh, I took took two days off at of work, and yeah, I'm paying the price for that. But um, <laughs> so it was a three day pilot class for what will be a four day course. So things were jammed right in. And Curdy's uh, designs, as you know, uh, cause you've done at least one are, are dense mm -hmm. and uh, lots of uh, 
Jessica's and Walnettos and beads and all of it. Mm -hmm. So I went to this class and yes, I took a table spot in the back corner <laughs> by the wall because that's <laughs> what I do. Um, but I didn't, you know, I didn't know what was going to go on. And of course, most of the people in the class had done pilot classes before mm -hmm. because the Fox chapters is just a lot of experienced, talented stitchers, very talented stitchers. And they do this stuff all the time. So it was fun because I just didn't understand what was to go on. Well, it's truly this pilot class is, is a, a real give and take exchange between those of us who are attending and the instructor because it's the shakedown class to find errors in the charts, uh, inconsistencies. If you're doing a, a Jessica stitch, you know, number got left off here for, uh, you know, up at, up at one, down at two, up at three. Oops, where's the four? Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things. Uh, instructions, uh, is there enough thread to do all the pieces, to do the whole thing, or do we need another skein? Uh, you know, is there enough thread so that if you uh, have to, tear something out, which some of us did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me. Um, all of those things. And so there was this for over the three days, it was nine to four each day. We took a half hour for lunch and one of the members uh, made lunch each day. So that was real nice and a couple breaks. But generally we were sitting there stitching and experiencing this class all day long for three days. And Curdy would show the uh, stitches and so it gave her a chance. She had a um, uh, projector for what was on her computer to show mm -hmm. the charts. And then she had a document reader so and had a canvas under that. So she would actually demonstrate stitches yeah. and, and go through that process. And, of course, she's demonstrating to people who can make most of them in their sleep. But uh, it's the experience of going through that. And is that clear? Is that not clear? To someone who really is there to learn mm -hmm. and so it was it was fun for me as a first timer at a pilot class to watch that exchange because it really became clear early on how important this is to the teacher mm -hmm. to to get this feedback throughout the day and then at the end of it then uh, hers is a three-part design is trilogy of threads it's her second one in a series and she's already working on the third one for next year um but it's a three-part design so then at the end people uh, volunteered to finish because of course there's no way you finish these things in, the, in those days you are uh volunteered to finish one section or another and then report back there were enough beads you know the, the enough thread uh, this stitch is <laughs> not clear all of those things and uh, so it was, it was fun. And the other thing I learned is I started out, because you start in the center of one of the octagons. There's two octagons and a, and a diamond, tri diamond uh, shape. And you, you start in the center. And immediately I want to start and complete each of the uh, things. So they're, they're geometric, they're symmetrical. So you do something in the middle and then there are four things on each side, you know, one thing on each side, each of four sides. And then, and so I was trying to complete all of them. Well, they, they you know, they're moving on. Uh -huh. And so, you know, get, get this done and move on to the next one and move on to the next one so that you keep up with the instruction. And then so you, you couldn't stitch in at the pace or in the style that you want to stitch. No, you really no. have to stitch in the way the teacher is saying we're doing this next to be to be part of the instruction yes if she's showing a stitch you want to be at that spot so then i would get in early each, the, the the subsequent days to try and catch up because uh and then it dawned on me on the second day you idiot quit trying to do all these things and and just do one of each and keep mm -hmm. moving north it was north you know moving north so i'm to the triangle or the diamond and then then up to the next octagon so that i can can be doing the stitch that she's showing mm. and uh so that was a, a learning experience so anybody who takes a class you know don't get bogged down and i got to get this completed no keep mm -hmm. moving with the instructor and then come back and fill in and and of course there was there were four ladies holy smokes arlene i i'll never stitch as fast as they do yeah. and and of course beautifully done you know it's not like they're slopping through it i mean beautifully done 
man, they were just flying. The, the, the thing was just emerging on the canvas as we go. Uh, oh, impressive the speed they had. And, uh, um, yeah, just excellent stitching all the way. But, I mean, that's, you know, that's the kind of stitchers we have in the Fox chapter. I'm sure several do, but uh, we have just a bunch of them like that. So it was fun to walk around and, and see, oh, this is what it's going to look like. This is really neat. And uh, so it was just an excellent experience to see that and to see that exchange because there was a, a true exchange with all of these uh, highly skilled veteran stitchers and Curdy, who was obviously highly skilled and, and, and a veteran at this stuff, mm -hmm. th this true exchange so that when she walked out of there with her notes and then whatever comes afterwards, she will be fully armed when she gives that class at the seminar. And uh, it, was, it was just a really neat experience to, to see that happen and be part of it uh, as, as we went along. So, uh, yeah, really, really fun. And, and now in uh, July, Debbie Rowley is coming to do a piece that she's, to pilot a piece that she's giving at seminar. So now I'll have a little more experience and, and uh, uh, I think get a little more out of it. But, um, yeah, it was fun. It was fun. Yep. How many people were in the class? Ooh, dozen. Okay. Dozen, 15 tops. Yeah, they're not big classes. And, and these pilot classes, the, the teachers tend to want to limit the number. They don't want 50 people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, because cause a seminar class wouldn't have 50 people. No, They'd be limited no. in a seminar class anyway. Right. Um, but, uh, no, they, they like to keep it limited so there can be that exchange. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And, now, uh, will you finish the piece? Actually, yeah, I will. I will because it's, I mean, it's a, it's my, I have three Curdy Biggs charts and this is the first one I've actually started and yeah, I will finish it. And I think I'll go to work on it uh, pretty hard because it's the kind of thing that appeals to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's complexity, there's good challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, her designs, her stitches are, are small on the small side because she packs, as you know, she packs a lot of stuff in. And so that presents a nice challenge to me. Yeah, yeah, I'll finish this thing because it's um, it's it it checks all the boxes that I like. Uh, right. You know, and, and the the design is immaterial to me. It is, it's the experience of stitching, uh, stitching the piece. So yeah, I, I will. I'm uh, um, I'll be digging in on this one. Yeah. What are the other ones you own? I'm just uh, curious. Hexafus, which is done on black. Okay. And that one I, I'm actually anxious to get to. And then what is the uh, – no, I can't remember the other one. The other one was one that was given to me a long time ago that looked intimidating at the time, but now not so much. But, uh, yeah, Hexafus. Oh, Arlene. Oof. Well, I, I'm on her website. I'm looking at it now. It doesn't have to be done on black. No, no. I'm okay. doing the black one, and I'm going to make it more blue. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That right. one. Mm-hmm. Yep, very nice. Yeah. So that was uh, that was a fun experience. It really was, mm -hmm. and educational. And then, mm -hmm. of course, uh, I mean, I you know I go to Fox meetings. Well, I like to say I go monthly, but when I'm in town, I go. Mm -hmm. And and you get to see a little bit of what some of these ladies stitch. And certainly, when they have the show and tell, and they show what they finished, and you get to see them up close. But uh, to see to see these these ladies in action was. Um, yeah, that, uh, some of that is really intimidating because, man, they can fly. They can really go. So, um, yeah, but, uh, you know, and each person does. I'm, I've never been a fast stitcher. I don't pretend to be, and I never will be. It's just not my deal. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, and then and then sitting there all day long, and there was um, at the end of the second day, there was a Jessica stitch. Man, I tell you, Arlene, I pulled that thing out twice. Yeah, <laughs> I was so, but I was so tired. See, uh, yeah, oh yeah, you know, and and I I I couldn't figure out where it's missing, and I'm trying to force myself to focus, and finally I just said, skip it. I'll get it in the morning, mm -hmm. and uh, and then I came back in the morning and and got it, you oh. know. But I actually had to pull out, uh, pull it out and throw the thread away. I had been through so many times, I just had to get in the trash. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, you, you get tired, your eyes get tired, and. And because uh, you have to really keep going at these things to stay up, you know, just to keep up with the class. It's not like, oh, I stitch a little bit here and I'll go have lunch or something. I mean, it's you want to keep up. And um, so it was an excellent experience. And, and Curdy's a really, really excellent teacher. 
and um, yeah, anybody has a chance to take a class with her will uh, will thoroughly enjoy it. And um, yeah, it was yeah, good one, good one. That's that sounds like a wonderful opportunity yep. to do things like that. Yep, that was good. Yep. Now, and something happened to me, and you had pulled out for us to talk about an article in the Inspirations newsletter. And anybody who's not getting the Inspirations newsletter that comes every Friday is absolutely missing out. Just sign up for that. It's free. Take it. Always good stuff in there and certainly beautiful projects to look at. Uh, some of the embroidery work in particular that people do is just mind-blowing. Mm. But, but you had pulled out one from two or three weeks ago about using knots. Mm -hmm. And I will say, until this pilot class, I have, other than a way or waist knots, mm -hmm. I have never put a single knot in anything. Okay. Okay? That changed at this pilot class. Very interesting. And so it was interesting that you brought this up because, I mean, I, I, mean, I will fight long and hard to not have a knot. Okay. But we were using Silk Pearl. Yeah, sure, I don't remember the name of it. May may have been a Verisois or one of those, yeah, one of those uh, Silk Pearl, mm -hmm. which is just, I mean, it's like somebody put grease on it and then heated it up to make it extra slippery, you know? Okay. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't latch onto anything. Mm -hmm. And so my normal thing would be to do a Bargello tuck to anchor that thing. Mm -hmm. And it was pulling out of that. Like I couldn't get tension on the first, proper tension on the first stitch because it was pulling out. Mm -hmm. And Curdy mentioned in the teaching, you know, this is slippery stuff and it's a, a small diameter thread. You might want to put a little knot on just to keep it from pulling through. And of course me, no, no way, no way. I'm not putting any knot on anything. I redid, you know, it pulled through about four times. Okay, I'm putting a knot in. Yeah. <laughs> so so I put I put a little just a single tie, single tie knot at the end mm -hmm. and then pulled it through and did a bargello tuck just to keep that thing from slipping through. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that I've ever done it. And now every time I stitch something with that thread on that project, uh th that first thing is gonna be a knot. Uh and, you know, it's not gonna cause a bulge on the front because it's sure. thin thread and it's a small knot. But, boy, you needed something to hold that thing. And then you mentioned this article about whether knots are legitimate and, and, and should be or could be used. And it was so it was a nice tie in to that because I'm just generally opposed to that. But this article suggests, hey, at some point, if it's not going to cause a big bump on the front, uh, what's wrong with it? Yes. Um, now, I'm just curious. There, so there was like what stitch were you using that? slippery thread for such that you couldn't use um now and i always get confused that the difference between the terms away knot and, and waist knot but basically most of the time i will use a knot a, away and then be, but put it in a location such that i'm stitching in that direction so that underneath i'm catching some of that thread and then as i get closer to that knot i just snip it from the front now, I don't know if that's called a waist knot or an, or an away knot, but that's what I do. What were you, what, but that said, there are times when I'm doing canvas work when there's really not much going on underneath the, you know, the, whatever stitch I'm doing, there's not much underneath that I can really barely catch the thread underneath. Thus you know the problem. Thus, thus the, problem. the problem. Yes, because there's these... Uh, this was a Jessica stitch. Okay. Yeah. So there wasn't much to catch underneath. No. Okay. And so I'm trying to catch it on something that is adjacent to. Okay. And uh, even that was, there wasn't a lot to work with there either. And okay. Because, yeah, the, yeah, the standard, and uh, waist knot, away knot, um, I do, I do, I, I guess I use them interchangeably, and I know there's a technical difference. But, I'll, yeah, I'll put a knot uh, some way away so that I have enough of a thread so that when I finish the stitch, I can cut that knot off and then bury the thread. Oh, um, so I don't do anything about burying it. I just, oh. I just make sure that it's like going to get covered. The thread behind it that's running behind it is getting covered with the stitches as I'm stitching closer toward 
the knot that I've created. Yes. And see, that may be the waist knot. And then the away knot is where what I do, which is to stitch and then come back, cut that off and then thread that end and then weave yep. it under. So there, so that that's why the difference. Yeah. So and I, I, use, I, I, I would weave it under anyway, even if I caught it, I would still clip it and weave it under just because I just get freaky about making sure those things are anchored. So nope. that's just me. <laughs> just so you you make sure you catch it enough times that you don't have to worry about it. Yes, I mean, and and sometimes in canvas work, I do, you know, check. I mean, some of this evolved over the, well, if I do it this way, I don't have to keep, I don't, I don't I, most of the time when I'm stitching, I don't flip over to the back of my project because then I'll, I now, canvas work pieces, it'll very much vary because it depends on what kind of stitch I'm on. Right. But certainly um, cross stitch and black work, that I'm not doing reversible black work. I'm not talking about that. But a lot of the stitching I've been done, doing in the most recent time, um, I'm very rarely flipping over to the back of my piece because, and maybe this has just evolved out of laziness. I'll start, <laughs> which I'll, sure. Actually, some of it evolved. There was a period of time where I'd, the clamp on my stand was starting to crack and I, w I was waiting for a replacement to be sent to me and I was trying to be so gentle with it that I didn't want any like extra movement evolve. And uh -huh. I, I think that's where this style evolved <laughs> at that time when I was waiting for the replacement clamp to come before the whole clamp that I had broke. Um, but so I'll usually start with a knot that I'm stitching towards, making sure I'm catching it and just until I can you know, feel comfortable to the point where I can clip it from the front. And then when I'm ending, I just, you know, pull up from, you know, again, in the direction that I know is eventually, whether in that immediate time or some point in the future, is going to get covered with threads from the back and and not be, um, you know, have any threads running back there. And if it's a time, if it's a place or a location where I won't be able to clip it from the front such that, you know, I, if, I, if I clipped it from the front, you would see some thread running. I just won't clip it from the front for a while. I will just wait until there's a time that I actually do have to turn over to the back and I have to bury a thread because of whatever the situation. At that time, I will then clip any other threads that are still hanging around because I was waiting until a time where I could clip them close to stitching. Um, so it's just, it's become a method that I just don't have to flip over my work most of the time. That's just what I've been doing. Um, yeah, well, see, that's just it. Now, see, I don't mind flipping it over, and I do it all the time. But, yeah, I, I, I've seen more than one example of that where, in, in some instances, you'll have uh, strings of thread off to the side. Yep. Might might have three or four or five of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, as, yeah. as you're working through. And, and, yeah, then you come back and clean them all up at, at some juncture uh, later on when you know they're all anchored or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Back, back to the knot thing or starting with knots. Now I'm curious, you said that there's, there were plenty of advanced stitchers in this class. Did you at all like have a conversation about, um, or, or even observe were they, um, were they naturally starting with knots? What, what, what was the tendency of other members of this class in terms of not starting or, or not, not starting? <laughs> nope. Didn't. Um, Se several of them had a, a way waste knot. Uh, we're using those extensively. Okay. Yeah. And I probably should implement that more. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it's, it's a weird thing for me. I, I don't like having all those things all over. Mm. Um, that's like, uh, um, uh, you know, if you're doing full coverage cross stitch and what is that um, where they have all those threads going, how come I can't remember these names, but Parking. Parking. Yeah, I I don't know I I don't know if I could deal with that. So mm. I tend to yeah I tend to do a stitch or a series of stitches if they're connected and then finish off that thread. I I tend to like it that way. That's just me. But uh, yeah, there were several ladies at this class that there were there were away waist knots everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. You know they they clearly were comfortable just having them everywhere and to. Uh, an uneducated passerby, it would look like an absolute mess <laughs> because I mean, there were just things everywhere. But then if, if you knew what they were doing, you realize, well, all that'll go away at the appropriate time. So, 
Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't. And, and I don't, you know, I don't know, maybe I should work on that kind of thing. I often think when I see these things, should I work on developing and using that technique more? Would it be easier for me? I don't know. I just don't know. If what you do works for you, then. Yeah. Then no, that's my answer. <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm always, you know, I'm always looking for what could I do that might be a little different, might be a little better, might be a little faster. Uh, hmm. you know, it, it, does it give me more flexibility? So I'm well, always looking to change how I go about things. It's worth testing it out. Like I said, I am pretty sure my style evolved because of that couple of week time period that I was waiting and didn't want to break the clamp before the new, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, so no pressure I, there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could have stitched without the stand. I was just, you know, you know, you know, what um necessity is the the mother it? yep yeah of invention um but what i thought was interesting from this article is you know sometimes you hear those you know the the stitching police or the the um the right. the, the judges at the local fair and their comments you should never use knots and but what i loved about this article was some pretty well-known names in the needlework world saying, yeah, use them when it's appropriate. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, with the, with the caveats is as long as it doesn't affect the front of your work. Um, uh, yeah, there are times where it's completely appropriate. And then, uh, then it did have me, and I was going to ask you this because I don't a hundred percent remember, don't hundred percent know the definite answer. I was trying to figure out on my very, what I consider my very first stitching, my, for me, my very first cross stitching, did I use knots? Like, because for me, it was a self-taught experience. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I, my, what I consider my first cross stitching, although there, there was little like baby kits when I was a kid, for me, what I consider my first cross stitching when I was a teenager, and I talk about this in like my first and second floss tube videos from from now two years ago, um, they were patterns from an old magazine, and um, that I what what I knew to do X's, okay, <laughs> and yeah. I, I I know now there's so many things I know I didn't do like. I had, you know, I was using two strands of floss. I know I did not separate each strand and put them back together. I know I pulled two strands from the six of DMC. I know right, that. Right, yeah. So many things that I do now unconditionally, I know I didn't know when I started. But I was trying to think, what did I do to start threads? Did I just tie a knot? Or did, I mean, I wouldn't have in any way known about the, the concept of a waist knot or way knot, whatever. I, the only other thing I would have done, which I did for a long time in my stitching life, was to hold with one finger, like an inch or so of the thread on the back, and then start stitching until I knew that that thread had gotten covered over. But I really don't think I did that from the beginning. I don't know. Do you, can you remember, like, whatever you think of as your, first stitching do you know how you started oh very clearly uh, but see when i when i first learned it was needlepoint oh and that was needlepoint with wool oh okay. so and I, it was made very clear to me don't you ever like don't even think about putting a knot in and who made that very clear to you the person who was showing me at a shop oh okay uh, you know it was but but this was you know, you know back in the wool with basket weave days Okay. And uh, so then, it, you know, that was just drilled into me. You do not make knots. And, of course, if you're doing large fields of basket weave, you, you don't want a knot because uh, it will show. It but will. Um, okay. Uh, so then, yeah, that's how I would start is I would, uh, if, if you're starting a fresh canvas, you would hold that short length of, of wool and and then till you got a couple stitches and stitch over it till you got something going and anchored and then and then on you go and then after that there was almost invariably a place where you could anchor without any trouble at all mm -hmm. and and you usually didn't have with wool is so much friction that you didn't have to even go under very many threads to do it mm -hmm. uh, but so that's yeah that's where i learned and it's still to me anchoring and finish off finishing off threads is still to me one of the more frustrating things because I always feel like it takes a lot more time than it should, uh, even doing pin stitches and other things. And I know a lot of it is I'm just so afraid that it's going to pull out somewhere that I want to make sure it's not going to budge. 
and uh, it's still one of those things where oh, I got to start another thread, and um, you know what a pain. I wish there was, you know, wish somebody come and anchor these things for me, but um, uh, it, yeah, it's just yeah. It, I don't think it'll ever go away for me. It's always going to be one of those things. So, um, but Trauma, yeah, early stitching life. Yeah, well, you know, and that you know, stuff gets ingrained in you, and yeah. it's hard to shake it. So, yeah. So I just, yeah, battle on. But, yeah, that's how I, I was taught, and, and that's the only way I knew because I never, I mean, it was just a few years ago that I heard about an away knot or a waist knot. I mean, I always battled that hmm. thing. And then, of course, if you're doing basket weave, then making sure that when you anchor the thread after you're done that you don't cause undue tension on the front mm -hmm. uh, and and disturb that, that uh, evenness across the field. And, yeah. Probably one of the reasons I hate basket weave. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah. that's hard to do. You know that that basket weave uh, to do it well is, is it looks like such a basic simple stitch, but to do it well over a large area and have it look right, yeah, not so easy. Yeah, um, yeah. Really admire people who can do that. Yep. All right, that's going to be enough, I think, Arlene. Can I briefly talk about a... Um... We, we do have to talk about that sampler. Yes, almost forgot about that. Yes, uh, new new from the Works by ABC people. Yes. So um, there is... So I um, recently came out with a new design, but sort of in a, a different um, way of coming out with a new design. My friend McKenna, the same one who just put on the Stitch Nanigans retreat, had purchased uh, a little way, time ago a sampler... Um, purchased online, just one that she just fell in love with, just for all kinds of reasons. And then the thought was, could she, she was thinking, well, could I do something with this? And um, so we partnered together to do something with it. Um, and so the whole bigger picture of the sampler reproductions that are out there in the world, there are so many, um, but there, and, and as you have talked about, it does sometimes feel like there's a never ending supply. There were so, many, so <laughs> there were so many little girls out there who, did these samplers um, and done in schools on their own. Uh, you know, it's so many of them have a history that or have a background that's lost to history. And it's, it's hard to know the particular sampler. This one was done by a little girl named Mary Hogg. She was 13 in 1830. Um, and it is there, you know, like all of them that get reproduced, this one just has lots of wonderful um, pieces to it. It's a small one, which is very appealing. I think this is one thing that very much made it appealing to McKenna, um, as opposed to some of the monstrosities that you see out there that, <laughs> shall we say, can get a little intimidating. Um, so um, McKenna and I worked together to reproduce this design. Um, she started out with the charting of the cross-stitch parts of it, and most of it is in cross-stitch. Mary did use some specialty stitches, um, but was really neat as we were as I was like really studying it and looking at basically every place where there's a specialty stitch you can convert it to cross stitching if you just are a cross stitcher and you're like I don't want to do any of these cross stitching things excuse me I don't want to do any of these eyelets for example well it turns out Mary's eyelets are all perfectly um like four threads by four threads which would very conveniently convert to be four cross stitches um, or she was using some four-sided stitches, which you could easily replace with a cross stitch. Um, I wish that I could have, I did try doing as much research as I could to find the Mary Hogg that did this because she has um, inserted a fair number of sets of initials um, with a number of them being the, the second letter being H. So assuming many of those initials are her family members. Um, other hog family members um, and could not find definitively any particular Mary hog that it was. Um, but the searching was a lot of fun and, you know, it just leaves open the mystery of, of who she was and, um, you know, could, was this done within a school setting? Was it something done outside of school? There's the first set of letters, which does not have an H as the second letter. Um, she outlined the, that, those set of initials. Um, what was so special about that person that, you know, that person got outlined? Um, you know, you just, 
those are the those are the fun mysteries of these samplers. Yeah, well, I think that that's exactly what makes samplers to me so interesting is those yeah. little things. Yeah. Um, when there's a, a row of um, there was a row of stitches that that were <clears throat> basically just a cross stitches going up, down, up, down, up, down. And at one point, McKenna sends me this screenshot and she says something's off. I don't see I don't see it. And I'm checking my pictures and like gosh, I don't think there's a mis that McKenna made a mistake. And then when I was taking over the file and really studying it, realized that um, Mary Hogg had sort of gotten in, or it, was, it wasn't, it was cross it was eyelets. Mary had gotten in another eyelet. How did she fit another eyelet in there? <laughs> well, when you study, so I've, I've taken lots of pictures of the sampler and then was able to like um, enlarge them. And when you study it really carefully, she fitted in because she had, she had a border. She had a single stitch border. And she just decided to extend her single stitch border out one stitch. You know, she's just tootling along, going down, and she just made it go out one stitch. Because she's and a kid and she can. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, or, you know, when she didn't fit the date completely on the line, she 18, and then the three zero, I think I've got this right, went up a line because sure. it just um, so it's just it's fun to find those kinds of things. So um, this was a, a piece that we worked on together. And so it is it is not found in my Etsy store. It is found exclusively through McKenna's online store, which is 1884stitchery.com. Um, and so if you are interested in purchasing this sampler and again, it's it's a small reproduction sampler, which for some people is certainly appealing. Um, and also, if you are the kind that. Um, has, you know, there's that is it's appealing, but oh, hey, I don't want all those initials of people that I don't know. It's easy enough to take them out. That that was another thing that I know. Um, you know, as you look at all these samplers, and again, I've just come back from um, Phoenix where I got to go to the attic and see an amazing number of samplers. And you think, gosh, if I had all the time in the world and I could stitch all the samplers, um, what it, what's appealing, what's not appealing of, of different ones, and you find the pieces that you like. Um, and perhaps Mary Hogg is one that <clears throat> has the pieces that are interesting to you. So um, there, there you go. That's the latest thing coming from Works by ABC. Yay. A little foray into the samplers. Yay. Absolutely. Good for yeah. you. Yep. There, there might be others coming in the future, so I'll keep you posted on that. All right. Okay, uh, that's it. So we have uh, wetalkfiber.com. We have the free chart from Brendan Kirk, Brendan and Karen Kirk. We have a Stitch In to Summer, Needlepoint Retreat, uh, Ann Carr. Contact her. Uh, we have the uh, Royal School of Needlework online courses. That uh, ten percent off. Talk ten is the code. A, a link on the uh, on the page for that. And hey, if anyone wants to sponsor one of these podcasts, let me know. I'd be happy to have a sponsor. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> just let me know. Gary at wetalkfiber.com. We'll work something out. Um, that's it. Thanks, Arlene. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for listening. Take care.